right. Uh, hopefully, this will display the screen. Rachel, yeah, you know, looks good. Does not look good. No, it does look um, good. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I am joining from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, and much of what I'm going to describe um, has been sampled in the territories of numerous. Um, peoples uh, up and down the coast. Uh, I also really want to thank my students who have helped with the sort of rapid response following up on the mortalities after the big heat wave we had at the end of June, because without them, there would be far fewer data points on the maps that I'll show you. And for all of you who are more used to looking at trees or grass, uh, uh, this is what a disaster in a mussel bed looks like in this photograph. Um, all those animals are dead, and you can tell because they are gaping open, you know, like you would receive them in a restaurant after they've been cooked. All right, so uh, how bad did it get at the end of June? Um, the, the heat dome that we had was really unprecedented. And if you look at the scale bar on the right, that is the deviation from long-term average and some of those sorry chris we can't see your slides advancing oh dear well let's back out and try again we uh, did see all the dead muscles though <laughs> well, that's a very powerful picture thank goodness you could see that <laughs> all right uh let's try it without an external monitor on there and see if this comes up how does that look Perfect. Great. All right. And can, can you see it when I change it? Yep. Okay. Excellent. Thanks for letting me know. All right. The, the star here is Lytton, British Columbia, which uh, it was a three day heat wave. On the first day, it set a Canadian national record for high temperature. On the second day, it set it again. On a, the third day, it set it again, was hotter than Las Vegas had ever been. And on the fourth day, it burned down and two people died. So it's this sort of biblical um, level event. Um, so what did that do to uh, sort of our coastal marine ecosystems? This photo is taken on that hottest day on June 28th, and it doesn't look that bad um, unless you look at it with a thermal imaging camera and realize how hot um, those rocks have gotten at low tide. Um, the number on the top left there, the 23.2, is where the little sort of target is pointing. So that's at the water. Um, the scale bar on the right shows the coolest and the hottest parts of the image. So some of the rocks um, um, in the intertidal zone at low tide were above 50. And this was the muscle bed, and some of those temperatures were also well into the 50s. And I have to admit, I have studied heat waves on rocky shores for decades and did not expect to see temperatures in the 50s in British Columbia in my lifetime. So um, it was really hot. It was actually uncomfortable to work this low tide. We were uh, worried about our own safety. Uh, and lots of things died as a consequence. You can imagine if you're something fairly soft and squishy like a sea star being left sitting out on the equivalent of a frying pan for a few hours is no good for you. Uh, so we saw sea stars die. We saw crabs die. We saw some clams die. We saw um, dog whelks, that's the bottom right uh, image there, die. Uh, but all of these things uh, are mobile or can bury in the sediment. And so um, although there were individuals that got unlucky, there were plenty more that found uh, a shady spot to hide or were deep enough in the sediment or, or in deeper water and were okay. The species that really suffered a lot were the ones that are attached directly to the rock and don't move. So seaweeds, um, mussels, and barnacles. And those barnacles on the right, those are two species that can survive exposure for several hours, uh, temperatures up to about 45 in one case and about 48 in the other. So they're really thermally tolerant and they, they still died. Uh, so um, my, my student Lara happened to be doing a project on rockweed uh, uh, at a particular site. And this is a photo she took a few weeks before the heat wave. 
Um, this is a few weeks after at the same site, and uh, the, the damage is still in the tissue of these uh, remaining individuals. So about a month after the heat wave, that shoreline was almost completely denuded. So um, really big impacts on the seaweeds, really big impacts on the mussels. They are probably the best sentinel for this. Uh, you know, having a, a black shell is probably no good on a hot, sunny day. Uh, the photo on the left, it just shows dead and gaping mussels. The one on the right is someone, uh, just a member of the general public sent it to me uh, that shows snow drifts of blue mussel shells washed up on Galliano Island. So uh, really unusual and extensive uh, mortality. And to give you sort of a more visceral sense of what these shorelines were like uh, during the heat wave, here's a video of me walking along a shore in Galliano and hopefully you can hear the crunch. That's not a normal sound you get when you walk in these habitats. When the mussels are alive and closed, they'll support your weight, but when they're just dead and empty shells, um, they don't. And you can see that just goes on and on. Uh, and in this particular spot, it's an area about the size of a tennis court, and with some random quadrat sampling, we estimated that a million mussels died just in that tiny area. So the total scope of the mortality is staggering. Uh, but there are some interesting patterns in there. Um, the shorelines are, are complex and some surfaces face south and would get hotter and others face north. So what this graph is showing is the angle of the rock. So if the sun is sort of directly above you, if you were laying down on the rock, um, that's 90 degrees. And then as you are sort of oriented further and further away from that, eventually you hit zero degrees and you're in the shade. And if we plot where mussels died and where they survived, you can see that's really strongly related to whether they were exposed uh, to the sun. These are data from Stanley Park in Vancouver. So if you were in the sun, you were really in trouble. If you were in the shade, you stayed cooler and you were okay. Uh, there are patterns at larger spatial scales too. So this is a zoom in on that earlier image of where it got hot. And you can see the Strait of Georgia here was, was especially warm. Uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca stayed fairly cool. Um, and we're, we're not quite at the stage of bioclimatic um, envelope modeling for this. So the maps that I will show you are not quite as sophisticated as ones you've seen earlier this morning. We are still at the emoji stage of science. Um, but on the outer coast where it was cooler, um, things mostly did pretty well. Um, through the Strait of Juan de Fuca, things mostly did pretty well. Um, it's only once you get into Hood Canal, Puget Sound, the Strait of Georgia, and then some of these inlets up on the central coast of BC that uh, the mortalities were really high. Um, that's a combination of it being hotter in those areas and the timing of the low tide being centered more sort of early afternoon instead of um, mid-morning. But not everything died. <laughs> and it's interesting what survived. Uh, we have non-native eelgrass, non-native sea anemones, non-native oysters, non-native mud snails, non-native sponges, non-native chitons, non-native clams, non-native limpets. Uh, a lot of these species did conspicuously well compared to um, the native species. And if we plot, for example, the um, introduced Pacific oyster on this same plot where I've shown you the native mussels already, there was some mortality in these at the, you know, basically the hottest site that I visited. Um, but you can see they really had to face directly into the sun to be at threat. And then there's this whole range of habitat angles where the oysters were fine and the mussels still died. So um, advantage oysters. And you can see that in, in uh, places that, that we can still visit because the, the shells are still on the rock. So here are a bunch of living oysters that survived the heat wave, intermixed with dead barnacles that died, and then piles of mussel shells that, that also died. So we're, we're seeing sort of this uh, disproportionate effect on the natives. All right, so if we're losing our cold adaptive native species, where might the replacements come from? And I show this uh, photo of one of the major ports in the region as foreshadowing. Uh, what you might often expect with climate change is that species will just sort of migrate poleward um, with warming. And for North America, that would mean, um, you know, BC and Washington would start to look more like Oregon, which would start to look more like California. But because we have this cold water current that flows south along this coast, BC and Washington already look like Oregon. And for California species to make it to the Salish Sea, they not only have to cross this biogeographic barrier at Point Conception, they have to swim or drift uh, in the opposite direction of the current. So it's really hard 
to get things that are warm adapted uh, into the Salish Sea from places like Southern California or Mexico. But they may arrive from elsewhere. Uh, so the next images are gonna show where trade comes from into Vancouver and the ports are color coded based by the predominant water temperature. So um, water's up here, this sort of uh, dark green color, which corresponds with you know, somewhere in the 14 to 16 degree range in the, in the summertime. U.S. is a major trading partner with Canada, but not so much for the maritime trade. So only 3% of the shipping traffic into Vancouver from, comes from the U.S. You know where over 50% of that trade comes from are warm water ports in Asia. So China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and India. Uh, and you can just see from the color coding how much warmer the waters are in these areas. So, you know, the seagrasses we get, the, those weird little chitons that we've got, the, those sponges, they're coming from warmer parts of the world. So um, that's going to be one of our next big steps is understanding what sort of the thermal geography of those species are in their native ranges and then how that might apply as things are warming up in the Pacific Northwest. All right, so to, to sort of summarize, uh, we have documented now that that extreme heat event and, and likely others that will be similar to it um, have a definite negative impact on a lot of native species, and that may reduce biotic resistance to, um, to invasion. Um, a lot of the non-indigenous species in the Salish Sea um, are not just migrating, uh, you know, uh, or arriving from further south on our coast. They're arriving from um, distant parts of the world that are considerably warmer. And so they are just inherently more tolerant of high temperature. Uh, I haven't had time to talk about it, but we know that rising mean temperatures are also allowing um, introduced species to reproduce in areas that were formerly too cold. Um, so those Pacific oysters uh, used to only reproduce in one or two sort of sheltered warm water bays in British Columbia, but now they can reproduce in more places and we're seeing a population explosion of oysters. Um, we are not necessarily getting a lot of warm water taxa um, naturally migrating in just because of how unique the Salish Sea is in terms of being a hot spot um, protected by a cold water southward flowing current. Um, so my expectation is that with climate change, we're going to see community composition shift away from natives like mussels towards um, non-natives like oysters, which are going to have big impacts on food webs for all the species that rely on those um, animals for habitat, um, for water filtration and all those other ecosystem services. So um, we, we were really caught off guard by how severe this heat wave is. So I feel like the ecologists are a bit on the back foot here, but this is gonna be an active area of research for the next several years. So stay tuned as we work through this. So I know we're a little behind, so I'm not sure if I have time for uh, questions right now, but I'm happy to answer them in the chat if I don't. Um, we did get one question in that we can uh, give you, which is, would you consider assisted migration? My chat keeps closing every time. Let me see. Would you consider uh, assisted migration to get North American native species up from Oregon and California? Yeah, that, that may not be a bad idea. Um, Oregon and Northern California, for the most part, have very similar species to the ones we have in Washington and BC. So you might have to go a bit further south to Southern California, um, but that's not a bad idea. So it's sort of it sort of depends on do we want our system in say Seattle or Vancouver to look more like San Diego or do we want it to look more like Taiwan uh, and if there's a reason to go with San Diego then some assisted migration may be necessary to accomplish that. <laughs> 